When Malcolm Rogers arrived in 1994 to lead the Museum of Fine Arts, he was a relatively unknown Londoner. Now he's one of the museum world's major figures, and he marks his 20th anniversary this week. The soon-to-be retiring Rogers recently talked with WGBH News arts editor Jared Bowen about his accomplishments as museum director and his latest controversy. Malcolm Rogers, it's great to have you here. Happy anniversary. Thank you so much. 20 years is a long time, but it's also not a long time. Can you believe that it's been 20 years? It goes like lightning, and at the same time, I feel I've been here all my life. You know, they've been 20 incredibly busy and incredibly fulfilling years. I'm wondering, I'll just launch right into it. I was in Europe at the beginning of this year, and I saw something I'd never seen before, which is a lot of people taking selfies of themselves in front of major masterpieces, and I was watching them. They're they were more interested in taking selfies than they were of actually looking at the art. So looking at how much technology has come into play over the last 20 years of your directorship, I'm wondering if you feel that the museum experience really fundamentally has changed in the last 20 years. It's a huge, huge change, but fundamentally our mission is the same, I think, bringing art and people together. And I see what you saw in Europe slightly differently. I see people valuing the art enormously, but wanting to stress and to show to friends that they'd have a very personal experience of that art. I think that's very interesting. It's not just looking at a painting and saying beautiful, but it's the idea of being part of it, if you understand that, and then sharing it with friends and associates. Well, how do you get people to engage when, when people are so used to sort of a rapid-fire life? And I, and I know the Worcester Art Museum just had their own internal study that showed that people were whipping through galleries. Uh, I think they would go through three of the, their main European master galleries filled with the masterpieces, including Rembrandt, in about 90 seconds. Some people do, but our aim in life is to slow people down and say, pay a little more attention. And it depends how you present things, how you interpret things. The other thing we find is that people more and more are interested in learning experiences in the museum. Educational programs and so on are growing exponentially. So this is the issue. How do you deepen the experience? How do you get people to stay longer? How do you make it a richer experience? And we're trying very hard and I think succeeding. And does that mean the introduction of technology into gallery spaces? We do introduce technology into gallery spaces, but recent surveys show that uh, young people aren't necessarily wanting a technology um, experience, the all singing or dancing technology, but they also show that they are very interested in personalizing the experience through selfies. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, the Boston Globe has recently written about the number of uh, pieces of, the, a number of the masterpieces that the Museum of Fine Arts is known for, the masterpieces that people go to see by Van Gogh, uh, uh, Monet, all of the great masters have been out on frequent loan. And do you accept that criticism that too much of the MFA's artwork has been out on loan and not available for people to see? From as early as the 1980s, the museums had an international policy of lending abroad. Uh, initially to the Far East, and as you know, in the 90s, we opened a museum in Japan. Uh, we believe in sharing our treasures with the world, but we believe in getting the balance right. Uh, as it happens, people tremendously appreciate that they're seeing new works on our walls as well. And in the meantime, we're sharing things internationally. But I wonder, I looked at, after Sebastian Smee's piece uh, ran in the Globe, I looked at some of the comments, and there were a lot of people who were upset that, pe that pieces they know the MFA for, that are even advertised in a lot of the MFA literature, were not available to them when they went to see them. I mean, th that's got to be frustrating to hear, that people are frustrated that, that their own hometown artwork isn't available. I think people who comment in the way you're describing are already unhappy people in some way. If you come to the museum on any day, you'll find the bulk of our masterpieces there. And I have a much more positive post bag than you're <laughs> suggesting. And I also just quickly on that, that notion, there is a criticism too of the MFA for sending too many of these pieces out for reasons of financial gain. That these, whereas other major American museums don't necessarily loan for money, they say that the MFA is. 
Uh, you're completely wrong there. First of all, our lending is part of our international policy. We believe in sharing. Secondly, there certainly are fees for loans. And almost every major museum now in America or in the world does it. How openly they admit that, but it's happening all the time. In our case, uh, the fees that come in pay for curatorial salaries for conservation. They enable a lot of works that are in store at the museum to be uh, conserved so that we can use them at the museum, which is a, 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 after they go on tour. Another thing to remember is the Museum of Fine Art's financial position is very different from any other major museum in America. We have a comparatively small endowment for our size. We don't receive any money from our city, a small grant uh, from Massachusetts. So in effect, we're probably the largest privately funded museum in the world, and we're tremendously dependent on income streams of all sorts. Well, in that vein, over your directorship, a lot of other cultural institutions around the country have begun to look at how they operate and whether they should operate more in a business model to keep things financially viable, even sometimes bringing in business leaders rather than a, a person like yourself with a cultural background. You had come from the uh, National no, Portrait Gallery. background, right. in fact. I passionately believe that museums should be run in a business-like fashion. I don't believe they are businesses. But when I came to the museum, I saw a museum that was struggling with deficits. And I said to myself, you know, this museum is funded by philanthropists. How can I say to philanthropists that I'm pouring your money into a black hole? I think I had to send out the message and I still do a fiscal responsibility. And then people will invest in us. Well, and I think we're breaking a little bit of news here in announcing that you next year in March will open a Herb Ritz exhibition. We all know about Herb Ritz because you got in a lot of trouble the first time when you first arrived and had a very provocative Herb Ritz show. Is this, is this sort of needling people on your way out the door? You know, it's a little bit of fun, but also <laughs> to see how well Herb Ritz has stood the, the test of time. It's very interesting when I uh, first uh, worked on the Herb Ritz ex exhibition here in Boston. It was like throwing a, a stick of dynamite into the community. But now we see on the West Coast, the Getty Museum has purchased an archive of Ritz's work. One of their most popular exhibitions was, uh, was an exhibition of Herb Ritz. So I want to bring him back here 20 years later and say, how has he stood the test of time? He seems to be standing it quite well. Well, it's the perfect encapsulation to your career. Malcolm Rogers, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. My pleasure.